Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Sickle Cell Action Network, the weekly internet radio show presented by Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative and sponsored by Mast Therapeutics. We're coming to you live from Indianapolis, Indiana, and we're here to serve you by providing up-to-date information and opinion on all matters pertaining to sickle cell disease. My name is Gary A. Gibson, and I'm your host for the next two hours. Let me start by saying that I don't have sickle cell disease, nor do I carry the sickle cell trait. In spite of that, I am no stranger to sickle cell. Quite the contrary. You see, even though I don't have sickle cell, it has had a very huge impact on my life. That's true because its complications took my wife from me after 12 years of marriage. It also caused her to have a miscarriage that resulted in the loss of our twin babies that she was carrying while in a sickle cell crisis. So all told, a sickle cell has taken three lives from me, and I feel the pain of those losses every single day. I currently serve as the President and CEO of Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative, a community-based organization that has been serving people with sickle cell for over 45 years. Each day, I attempt to transform the pain of my losses into positive energy, energy that is focused on making a difference for those who are battling sickle cell. From being involved with sickle cell for over 40 years, I'm able to say that much progress has been made, but there is still so much work to do. This show is an opportunity to contribute to the ever-expanding dialogue about sickle cell that is taking place all around the world. Our show is about raising awareness, but it is also about so much more. I like to say that sickle cell awareness is important, but we need more than awareness. Those living with sickle cell are already aware. That makes me ask, so what are we doing for them? My answer is, not enough. That's why we've named this show the Sickle Cell Action Network, because awareness without action has very little impact. We want this show to be a source of information and a call to action to help those who must live with sickle cell in their midst. We have designed this show to provide information that is beneficial to patients, caregivers, family members, and friends alike. Most importantly, we want people with sickle cell to know and understand that they are not alone. The Sickle Cell Action Network show features live guests who are health care providers, patients, advocates, and others who are engaged in the fight to eradicate sickle cell and ease its burden on those it affects. Today, we are pleased to have a special guest who will speak with us about transition issues in sickle cell disease. Dr. Marsha Treadwell works at the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital in Oakland, California, and she is joining us today by phone. Dr. Treadwell will spend the first hour of today's show with us. You'll want to stay around for the second hour because we will be replaying the patient panel segment of our recent town hall meeting on sickle cell disease featuring the Centers for Disease Control. Before we get to today's topic, however, I want to share some of our upcoming topics with you so that you'll know what we are going to be doing. In future weeks, we will cover such topics as fundraising for sickle cell, and that will be next week, traveling with sickle cell, connecting the sickle cell community, and many, many others. So as you can see, we are serious about sharing valuable information, and we hope that you will join us every week, same time, same station. If you've missed some of our previous editions or wish that you could listen to them again, don't worry. Just go to the Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative YouTube page, and you will find them there. Now let's get on with our show, and we'll start with this week's edition of Sickle Cell News Update. And in today's news update, I want to share, I think, a really fantastic story. And that story is about the oldest person with sickle cell disease in the world, as far as anyone knows. Um, We actually touched on this, I think, several months back when we mentioned that her birthday was upcoming. And now we will say that it is true that the oldest person with sickle cell is celebrating her 90th birthday. At 90, Asiato Laguda is believed to be the oldest person with sickle cell disease in the world. She was born in November 1925, the same year as Margaret Thatcher, the first female British Prime Minister, and Malcolm X, the African-American civil rights activist. At the time that she was born, the average life expectancy of children born with sickle cell disorder in her country was just five years but she has defied the odds to live to 90. Due to the high level of illiteracy at the time of her birth, she was never diagnosed with sickle cell. She endured years of pain, which kept her away from school till she was 12 years old. Her pain was so severe and frequent that she would beg God to let her die. After primary school, she enrolled at Queens College in Lagos, where she met her husband, who later became a doctor. 
She did not know she had sickle cell disease until after she had given birth to five of her six children. Her husband, Dr. Ala Kija, gave her pills, including folic acid, to take every day, but he kept the nature of her illness away from her for a long time. Dr. Alakija had 10 wives and 27 children. When he died, she married another man, Alahi Laguda, but she never had a child with her second husband. In spite of her illness, she has outlived her parents, husbands, and siblings. According to the Sickle Cell Disease Journal, in which the story appeared, uh, she has, in spite of her illness, uh, she is under no dietary restrictions whatsoever. She eats salt, eggs, meat, sugar, fried food, as etc., whatever she likes. Her blood pressure continues to hover around 160 over 90. She has performed the Holy Pilgrimage to Mecca 13 times and Umrah half a dozen times. She observed the annual 30-day Ramadan fast until she was over 88 years old and until her children pressured her to discontinue that. She takes public transport in Lagos. She has given birth to six children, all by normal delivery. So, ladies and gentlemen, there is a person who is 90 years old in Nigeria, and she is outstanding, um, an outstanding example that you can live a very long time with sickle cell disease. Our next story in the Sickle Cell News Update involves a study that has been released and the title of the article about the study is Hydroxyurea Improves Lung Function in Children with Sickle Cell Disease. And the article reads, For the first time, researchers were able to demonstrate that children diagnosed with sickle cell disease showed improvement in lung function after treatment with hydroxyurea a treatment that is underused despite its demonstrated benefits. The study was presented at the ATS 2016 International Conference. With one in 500 people affected, sickle cell disease is most commonly inherited disorder in people of African descent. Persons with sickle cell disease experience an annual decline in lung function that starts in childhood, says Anya McLaren, uh, MD, the lead author uh, and respiratory medicine fellow at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. She says this study is the first of its kind to look at the effect of hydroxyurea on lung function. We found that hydroxyurea improves annual pulmonary function decline in children with sickle cell disease by more than one-third. After receiving the treatment, all 94 study participants ages 6 to 20 years old were followed for four years and their blood count, hemoglobin, uh, or their fetal hemoglobin, liver, and renal functions were measured at certain time points beginning at three months. Uh, two measures of lung function, one the FEV1, which measures how quickly a person can move air out or in his, in his or her lungs, and FEV25-75, which helps determine if there is an obstruction in the airway, were taken before and after hydroxyurea. There was significant improvement in both FEV1 and FEF2575 after treatment. More than a decade of research in young people has produced data on the safety and effectiveness of hydroxyurea. Despite the evidence, Dr. McLaren believes clinicians' concerns about patient noncompliance and fears of potential side effects, namely carcinogenesis, are the primary reasons hydroxyurea is underused but some of those fears may be unfounded. Long-term observational studies suggest beneficial effects without excessive damage to bone marrow, deleterious effects on growth and development, altered fertility, accumulation of mutations, or increased carcinogenity, said Dr. McLaren. Evidence that lung function may be better preserved while on hydroxyurea may encourage compliance and adherence to this medication for patients with sickle cell disease, added Dr. McLaren. In combination with the established safety data, it, helpfully, it hopefully will promote a, a physician recommendations for hydroxyurea initiation and encouragement of compliance. Um, the next story and our last story for today's Sickle Cell Action Network is that there was a... Um, the title is this, of the article is Triumphant Sickle Cell Walk, and the article comes to us by way of Kampala in Uganda. 
and I just think this is kind of a cool story. Um, it reads, ahead of the 6th International Sickle Cell Sym Symposium on May 25th to 27th in Kampala, an effervescent parade marching through the major streets and roads of the city was quite a good move to draw people's attention to the conference and the disease in general. Scores turned up at Malago School of Nursing and Midwifery to be a part of the Sickle Cell Walk 2016. The walk attracted people from the health ministry, sickle cell network, various stakeholders and individuals joined in the fight against sickle cell anemia in the country of Uganda. Bonita Nanziri, a fresh graduate of Makere University, invented an app that diagnoses sickle cell anemia. So it was to her, to her fulfillment to join in on the blowing of trumpets and create awareness about the sickness that silently kills people. Sickle cell disease results in abnormality in the oxygen-carrying protein hemoglobin found in red blood cells. In this walk, walkers blew trumpets, drawing attention uh, to people who were gawking at them from inside buildings and at the roadsides. And then a band did much in energizing and bringing life to the parade all through the walk. The procession left the nursing institution, crossed Yusef Luo Road, Nakasaro Lane, and Buganda Road to City Square, where it turned to use the Kampala Road back to the school. The two-hour walk was followed by different activities, including sickle cell screening and blood donation that carried on up to the evening at the school. I wish I had been able to see that. That seems like that was a pretty cool thing. Um, that's it for the sickle cell news update for this week, um, and we will take a break, and when we return from the break, we will start speaking with Dr. Marsha Treadwell from the Oakland, California area. This Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host, and I'm delighted that on the phone with me today is Dr. Marsha Treadwell. She's a Ph.D., um, and she practices out in Oakland, California. Um, at the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. And it's my pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Marcia Treadwell. Uh, Dr. Treadwell, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. What we always do is we, we ask our guests to, to tell us a little bit about themselves so that the people that are listening, um, you know, get to know a little bit about you. So first question for you is where were you born and uh, I just mentioned that you're out in Oakland but where do you live now where do you work and how long have you been there so tell us a little bit about yourself oh sure okay so um, I was born and raised in Indianapolis uh, so that is my home one of uh, seven brothers and sisters um, I came out to Oakland uh, probably about 30 29 years or so ago so quite a while so but um, once a Hoosier, always a Hoosier. <laughs> <laughs> However, I, I did go to the University of Washington in Seattle for uh, to get my uh, PhD, and again came down here to the Bay Area to do a fellowship in pediatric psychology, uh, and have been here ever since. Okay, so why sickle cell, Dr. Treadwell? What motivated you to devote so much of your career to this? Um, well, as I mentioned, I started out in general uh, pediatric psychology or, or health psychology, and so I saw a range of children and families who were exposed to different chronic conditions, acute illnesses, uh, trauma in the community, and so on. But once I started seeing people with sickle cell disease, and I really found that that was really... Um, uh, I was at home working with uh, families who are affected by sickle cell disease. I think what really has drawn me to the population is uh, there are tremendous difficulties that people can face, <clears throat> but they can show such tremendous resilience as well. Absolutely. And then further, uh, again, you know, I worked with children and families uh, and adults and families uh, as a clinical psychologist, but sickle cell disease is really embedded in um, a pretty dramatic social structure that is also a major issue with regard to what people do have to overcome. So people face uh, disparities in receiving quality health care. Um, they, they face... Uh, 
a society or an institution that isn't really adequately funding uh, the care and research in relationship to sickle cell disease. Um, and there can be some stigma associated with the, the diagnosis, uh, some discrimination as people seek treatment for pain. So my public health side of my interest really was drawn as well to really looking at this um, complex condition which is in a very complicated context and so that's why I really um, work with sickle cell and really find it extremely rewarding and my opportunity to really give as well to a population. And I would say that your characterization of sickle cell is very uh, accurate, right on point. Let's get to the subject at hand, transitioning of care for young sickle cell patients. The appropriate transition of the adolescent from pediatric care or the, of the adolescent and pediatric into an adult system of care is, is really important because a disruption in the continuity of care can produce problems that can often be prevented. Would you elaborate on why this is true? Uh, yes. Um, so many t um, complications in relationship to sickle cell disease do arise in childhood. Um, people can ex have asthma, uh, bone disease, of course pain that can turn into chronic pain, um, and uh, brain disease, so silent cerebral infarcts or overt stroke. And it's really critical to have an uninterrupted movement from pediatric care into the adult world because these problems actually can get worse during adolescence and certainly they're still there and get worse in adulthood. And so an interruption in medications, in comprehensive care, uh, in primary care can actually end up exacerbating uh, these complications that arose in childhood. Okay. Um, so what are some of the other things that can go wrong if this transition doesn't take place properly? Well, what's actually been observed is that uh, in, in our own study here in California, we looked at um, emergency department visits and inpatient visits and found that there was a four time or four fold increase in uh, emergency department visits at the age of 18 between the ages of 18 and 29 from pediatrics so we found that again all of a sudden patients started needing to come to the emergency room um, and then that pattern continued so it it skyrockets in the transition years and then stays high throughout the adult years in terms of emergency department and inpatient utilization. Um, most alarming, we actually found that, you know, where about 4% uh, mortality uh, is uh, found in the pediatric or young child childhood years, that rises to 15% in the adolescent uh, young adult years and again stays high after that. So something really dramatic is happening during the transition years that is literally life-threatening. And what's happening then is that, in general, um, the patients are not receiving the kind of comprehensive care that they were receiving as a pediatric or adolescent, right? Absolutely. So uh, sickle cell disease has been characterized as a, as a disease of childhood and there's been a lot that's been done to improve outcomes for children and starting with newborn screening when babies are identified with sickle cell disease they're started on penicillin prophylactically and that has reduced mortality in some places to, um, to zero um, because they aren't uh, subjected to overwhelming infection there's um, monitoring for stroke risk um, and other um, vaccinations that can prevent infection. So again, once the individual moves out of a comprehensive care model that includes a hematologist, um, nurse, practitioner, um, social worker, and moves into a situation where those um, supports aren't there, then their medical care can really fall apart. Right, right. You know, at last month's 2016 Indiana Sickle Cell Conference, you gave a presentation titled Issues in the Successful Transition from Pediatric to Adult Care in Sickle Cell Disease. 
First of all, thank you for coming to Indianapolis to share your knowledge with our community. But having said that, I'd like you to ask I'd like to ask you to share some of that information with our radio audience today. Let's start sure. with you sharing some of the information from the Dallas Newborn Cohort Study. Please tell us a little bit about that. Uh, okay, that is a study that uh uh, conducted in Texas, and the study started in 1983. So what they were able to do was follow all of the children who were identified on newborn screening um, and then followed in comprehensive care uh, in Dallas. And what they found is that um, they were able to, again, reduce mortality to zero in the under 18 uh, year old age group, but then in 2002, the deaths that occurred as they started to follow people who transitioned out of their pediatric comprehensive care program, they found that the only deaths were in individuals who had actually transitioned and within two years of the transition. So again, this is a very uh, stark example within, of within two years what we wow. see around the country. Within two years, it spiked like that. Yes. Wow. Okay. So in your presentation, you also you covered an area called family factors. What are some of those yes. family factors, and why is it important to cover them? Well, adolescents um, develop and grow within their families, so the support that the family gives is one critical piece to ensure that the individual really develops the skills that they need to move on into a productive adult life. So um, I'm sure your audience has heard about uh, sort of the tasks of adolescents or what the goals of adolescents are, and it really is to get to the point where you can become independent as an adult. You have to become comfortable with your yourself as a person. You have to adjust to uh, relationships with um individuals of both sexes and figure out what you're going to do with regard to your occupation and, and your future educational goals. And we've done research that's really looked at uh, what kinds of family factors support those tasks of adolescence and what can get in the way of an individual actually being able to move on into a productive adulthood. And what we found is that, again, the family is is really the most important uh, factor here in the sense that families have to be aware of what the child's needs are, what their strengths are, what their uh, challenges are, and support the person to move into the most productive um, adulthood that they possibly can. And a challenge can come up in sickle cell disease because I mentioned briefly that in, there's a high... Um, prevalence of brain disease or cerebrovascular disease, um, and so some of the individuals with sickle cell disease may have trouble with planning, with attention, uh, because of sickle cell disease, and uh, the family has to really be sensitive to that, set up the right schooling, um, have the right uh, demands of the child, yet at the same time understand that they may have to adjust some of their expectations if that individual child does have some uh, neurocognitive challenges that might interfere with their uh, moving into every area that they might like to as an adult. Okay. Um, you also spoke about a shared decision-making process within the family, so please tell us a little bit more about what a proper shared decision-making process might include. Certainly. So uh, there, there are some researchers and clinicians who have put together um, a really nice website that would be a good resource for your listeners called Got Transition. And so they, for many, many years, have been studying transition, not just in sickle cell disease, uh, but with other conditions. And what they put forward is the concept that the child, you know, is just, is the vessel that has to receive care when they're very young the parent or guardian is responsible to provide care, and the health care provider for a young child with a chronic condition has a major responsibility for directing that care. But quite soon, the child needs to start to participate in the care. The provider needs to ask them questions about their medications and uh, engage them in conversation about their symptoms. 
symptoms and how they're doing. The parent becomes more of a manager and the provider becomes more of a support to the parent and child. Then the child, as they get older, needs to become responsible for taking care of themselves at home, uh, making sure they drink enough water, making sure they take their medicine in the morning. The parent is still the supervisor because the child might forget and, you know, children are still maturing and developing, so the parent has to supervise and make sure all of those things happen, but they give the responsibility to the child to take care of these things. And the provider at this point becomes um, more of a consultant to the, the child with sickle cell disease and the parent because you have to remember that any given health care provider is only spending a few hours a year in with a person with sickle cell disease and their family. That person with sickle cell disease and their family is responsible for taking care of sickle cell you know, 24 hours a day seven days a week, 365 days a year. So by the time the young person transitions into adult care, they supervise their own health care. They give direction to their provider. They're a partner in their own health care. The parent at that point is a consultant and the provider becomes a resource. That's a very good explanation. Thank you for that. You know, of course, the patient and the family are two pieces of the puzzle. You've missed, you've actually missed, mentioned the other piece or another piece, which is the healthcare providers. What are some of the issues involved when it comes to healthcare providers? Um, um, the major issue that may not actually change is that there are actually very few adult hematologists. Right. So there, there are lots of pediatric hematologists who can take care of, of sickle cell disease, but there are very few adult hematologists out there um, who are able to take care of people with sickle cell disease and just the profession in general, there aren't as many. So that's an issue right off the bat. But then we can move into um, problems with coordination of care. So as a young person transitions from pediatric to adult care, it's really the responsibility of the pediatric provider to relay information about that person's um, clinical complications, their history, medications, and so on, to the receiving adult provider. But what's been found is that there can be a real issue with that coordination of care and that communication between pediatric and adult providers. Another issue that's been brought up is that the pediatric world and the adult world uh, can look very different in, med in, med in medicine. Yes. So um, if you've been to a children's hospital, you know, it's uh, characterized by bright colors and uh, music therapists and uh, toys and Lots of ways that... A lot of celebrities come through. Yeah. Celebrities come. Yeah. People are supported to take their mind off their uh, condition um, by uh, video games and visitors and and so on. But, you know, in the adult world, um, it's a little more business-like and straightforward in, term, in the hospital setting. And uh, so kids can really miss that environment they felt was so nurturing when, when they were younger. Um, so those, those are some of the, the contrasts between the two. All right. We're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, we're going to uh, speak with you up to the top of the hour when we know you have to go into an important meeting. Um, so if people are listening, please hang on, and we'll be back. This is the Sickle Cell Action Network, and I'm Gip Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host, and on the phone with me today is Dr. Marsha Treadwell um, from uh, Oakland, California, and she is a specialist in the area of transitioning sickle cell youth from pediatric to adult care. We've been having a great conversation, very informative so far, and we're going to continue the uh, discussion with another question that I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Treadwell. Um, Dr. Treadwell, in your presentation at the 2016 Indiana Sickle Cell Conference, you explained the six core elements of health care transition. What are those six elements, and how do they work together to create success? Uh, yes, so these elements uh, have been uh, endorsed by the American Academy of Pediatrics and um, have been really developed by the Center for Healthcare Transition Improvement 
um, and basically they talk about the pieces of the puzzle that fit together to support a successful transition. And the first thing that's important is to have a transition policy within a healthcare provider's office. Um, so what we can have run into in the years that I've worked uh, in this area is that sometimes a young person doesn't actually know that they are going to have to leave their provider if it's a pediatric provider. And so then that's where it can become a very big shock when it's time for them to to move on. You know, transition is a natural part of life, but if it's not handled in a natural way, then, then that can cause a problem. So putting forward what the transition policy is can really be helpful for the parent and child, even from birth, to know that just like school, you know, that individuals are going to transition, they're going to move on um, at a certain point in time. The second element is uh, that transition has to be tracked and monitored. So it's helpful in a busy caregiver's office to make sure that you know at when children or youth are coming up to the time when you need to have, start to have those discussions about transition. And these, uh, it's suggested that start around 12 or so. And so you document what um, is discussed and where the needs might be in terms of further development or support the person might need to move on to the next phase of their ability to be ready to be transitioned. And in fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, suggest that if you find there are areas the person needs more support in, then, you, then it's up to the provider really to meet with that family and child more often until the person is able to master some of the transition readiness um, aspects. And that's the third element, which is transition readiness. So the individual at, with um, sickle cell disease in this case and their family need to be ready in certain ways to transition. So it's important that they know their diagnosis, their treatment, uh, their complications, and then be ready in other areas of their life to move on to independent living at some point if they can, to uh, have a goal in terms of schooling and employment. The fourth element is uh, the actual planning and integrating into a, either adult care or an adult approach to care. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the pediatric world uh, can be uh, very nurturing um, well, and, and as it should be, because uh, childhood illness is really difficult for families and kids, and they deserve to be very nurtured. Um, it doesn't mean that the adult medical world isn't nurturing. It just means that there's just a little bit different expectation in terms of the responsibility that falls on the individual with a chronic condition to make decisions for themselves, uh, and then other aspects of uh, planning, such as privacy. So the parent needs to know that after a certain age, they don't just automatically get information about their child's health without that child or individual's permission. Right. Um, uh, then next is the actual transfer. Um, and so, again, it can look different ways. Uh, the individual can move from a pediatric care facility to an adult care facility. The individual can actually move from a pediatric approach to an adult health care approach within the same facility. So let's say you're dealing with a family medicine or, or medicine, it's called MedPed, where you do work in the same, you're in the same setting. However, the provider needs to start to introduce different expectations of functioning in the adult um, world. And then the sixth component is transfer completion or ongoing care. And some would argue that the, the transfer might never be complete, although, again, what it can look like is that where during the transfer, the pediatric provider is available to the adult provider uh, to answer questions or to give some advice, um, at some point it becomes then the adult provider's responsibility and they won't need to turn back to the pediatric provider with their questions and concerns. Right, but that handoff between the pediatrician and the adult doctor, that is that is a very critical step. It's absolutely critical. Yeah. Other chronic illnesses can also benefit from a well-planned transition process. What 
makes transitioning in sickle cells so unique in your opinion? I, I think one of the unique aspects of, well, two particular aspects are uh, unique to sickle cell and really important to consider. First is the experience of pain. Now, in medicine in general, uh, pain presents one of the biggest challenges because there isn't a lab test for pain. Uh, pain, the definition of pain is whatever the person says it is. So you may have them rate their pain, uh, you know, point to where their pain is, that kind of thing. But unless they have a broken bone uh, or uh, acute appendicitis, the provider can't tell how much pain the person is in. Mm-hmm. And uh, children with sickle cell disease learn to live with pain. They uh, function with pain. And so when um, a 21-year-old walks into the emergency room and says, I'm in pain and I need morphine, then in this society, then they can be looked at as seeking drugs as opposed to uh, being a good coper with a chronic condition that they've lived with for their whole life. And at this point, they know what they need and they're simply asking for it. So pain, again, is a unique aspect. The second thing is... um, uh, the potential for neurocognitive challenges. And so, again, what that means is that there can be sickling that affects the brain. And that's another invisible, to some extent, um, complication. Absolutely. So that um, a child looks uh, perfectly normal, socially skilled, and yet uh, they forget, they can't, they aren't planning well, their attention span is low, and without neuro psychological evaluation, um, then they may be labeled as difficult or not adherent as opposed to understanding that this sickling in the brain can continue to occur throughout life so that someone who didn't have issues early on with any of these neurological and neurocognitive challenges can develop them. And providers need to be alert to that. And again, rather than um, have punish the patient, let's say if they forget an appointment, try to understand, is it because they have these issues uh, in relationship to neurocognitive challenges? Great. I, You know, I had a whole bunch more questions to ask you, but I'm trying to be cognizant of your time, and I'm going to skip over a couple of them, but one of them that I really wanted to ask you, are there any ethical issues involved in transitioning, and if so, what are they? I think that if you look at the ethics on the both sides of the adult provider and the pediatric provider, then you really have to, as a pediatric provider, say to yourself, you know, the ethics of this are that I cannot just dump this patient. If I send them out from my practice without a plan, without a competent adult provider to take care of them, then that is unethical. And on the other side of things, the adult provider, you know, if I don't consider that this individual has some unique challenges related to sickle cell disease and I don't make some adjustments, then then that is unethical. So the concept of medical home is something that's well developed in the pediatric world where uh, pediatric providers do understand that you have to have a holistic view of your patients. And um, adult practices get big busier and bigger, and um, so, again, a patient who doesn't uh, make an appointment or doesn't call in to cancel appointment may be looked at negatively rather than understanding that maybe they need a little extra assistance or maybe they need um, uh, an evaluation to understand if what's underlying that is really um, these neurocognitive challenges. So I think trust is an ethical issue in sickle cell disease and in um, transition within this condition in the sense that trusting the patient to be honest, um, trusting the patient to report accurately on their pain is uh, something that the provider needs to do, but then the patient needs to be ethical and foster that trust and and be honest uh, and have open communication. So um, those are some of the ethical issues in transition. I think the, the last thing I'll say about that is really has to do with advocacy. And-
and um, sickle cell providers have to be prepared to advocate for their patients and families uh, in the school system, in, uh, in employment. I mean, that's a whole topic that we could talk an hour on is that people with sickle cell disease can be underemployed right. because the employment system doesn't, uh, isn't flexible enough for someone who misses here and there, and the school system isn't flexible enough for people who miss here and there right. to get, allow them to catch up. And um, so that support or advocacy in the school, in employment, with policymakers, with legislators, all of that comes into play when you're dealing with the sickle cell population. That's a really good explanation. Appreciate that. So in the end, who has the ultimate responsibility for establishing a transition process? Is it the parents, the provider, the social worker? Who really drives this? Oh, I think it really has to be a, a teamwork. Okay. That you have to understand, the provider has to understand the unique needs of that individual and that family. And um, they have to listen to what the unique needs are of that individual and family. And individuals and families have to speak up and talk about what they need. And they have to, again, be in partnership with the provider to interview new potential uh, providers to understand what that new provider may have to offer. Um, again, teamwork where um, fear of the unknown can come into play and where you, the provider sets up um, tours of a new facility or a visit to the new provider's office and doesn't, again, just transition, today's your last day, and then next week you go to that new person, but rather make sure that I'm still here, you know, for the, uh, make your first visit, give me a call when you're done, and let me know what happened and what you think. Okay. Um, Dr. Treadwell, is there any other advice that you'd like to give parents that might be listening right now? <laughs> Um, well, uh, my advice would be to to know your child, um, have expectations for your child and your young adult, uh, have them be realistic. So even if an individual has any physical limitations or uh, cognitive limitations, you can still expect the most from them, what they're capable of giving. And every child with sickle cell disease really is able to move on to um, education, employment, um, and it's important for families to foster that. I know it can be hard for families to see their child in pain, uh, to see their child in the hospital, and but at the same time, um, what I've learned from the, the families is, again, that resilience, that people really can overcome some of the worst circumstances and uh, move on to give back to society and be the best person that they can be. Oh, Dr. Marcia Treadwell, you have been a tremendous uh, source of knowledge for us today. We at the Sickle Cell Action Network uh, thank you for spending an hour with us today. We wish you continued success in your work and your passion. Your passion comes across very, very strongly, uh, and hopefully the people on the other end of the uh, radio or the computer can, can understand that you are passionate about what you do, and we thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. And we will be back after the uh, break. This is the Sickle Cell Action Network, and I'm Gary A. Gibson. Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host. The Sickle Cell Action Network show is sponsored by Mass Therapeutics, a publicly traded by a pharmaceutical company headquartered in San Diego, California. MAST is currently leveraging the molecular adhesion and sealant technology platform derived from over two decades of clinical, non-clinical, and manufacturing experience with purified and non-purified palaxomers. MAST has developed a drug called MST-188 as a candidate for serious or life-threatening diseases with significant unmet needs. Among those needs is the treatment of sickle cell disease. MAST has enrolled sickle cell patients in a clinical trial known as EPIC. EPIC stands for Evaluation of Purified Palaxomer in Crisis. If successful, EPIC could result in the first treatment of its kind to treat sickle cell disease patients while they are in crisis. The EPIC study aims to determine whether MST-188 can shorten the duration of a painful crisis. MST-188 is an investigational drug that has not been approved for commercial cell in any jurisdiction for any use. 
MST-188 potentially improves oxygen delivery and it may help keep blood vessels from becoming blocked and more obstructed. It may improve blood flow by stopping cells from grouping together. It also may reduce inflammation and it may restore cell membranes and give damaged cells time to heal. EPIC participants continue to receive their normal pain treatments during crisis and their participation is free of charge to them. The patients involved in the EPIC study may not only be helping themselves, but they might also be helping future generations of those yet to be born. If you're interested in learning more about the EPIC study, please visit www.theepicstudy.com. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just a few weeks ago here in Indianapolis, we held um, a meeting that we called the Town Hall Meeting on Sickle Cell Disease featuring the Centers for Disease Control. Um, it was a historic event, uh, definitely here in Indiana, the first time that such a meeting has ever been held. And we were delighted that we had representatives from the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, participate in the meeting with us. They provided us with a presentation of the things that the CDC is doing uh, with regards to sickle cell. Um, and they sat and listened uh, to testimonies from uh, sickle cell patients and um, sickle cell doctors and uh, sickle cell board members and it was a tremendous event. We were very happy that we were able to host it um, here at Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative. But some of the content during the presentations was just so powerful that we thought it might be a good thing to share it with those that were not able to listen to the live broadcast here on RadioNext.TV. Um, and so we want to replay portions of that session and we're going to start with a uh, session uh, with the patient panel um, and we will start that right now. And now it's time to hear from some courageous and talented sickle cell patients each of whom carries the additional responsibility of serving as patient advocates. I am sure that you will soon agree with me when I say that they tell their stories well. Seated on our patient panel today are Darlene Ransom, Anderson Cavalier, William Blunt, Julie Daniels, and Lena Harvey. As well, we will have presentations coming up from Ms. Uh, Sabay Martin, and then Dr. Emily Meyer. But before we get there, just so you can connect, Sharon Hatcher Hutchinson, who is also one of our parent, uh, patient advocates, was going to be here today. And she texted me a while before we started and said, I'm sorry, I'm hurting, I can't make it. Now, why I'm saying that is because I want you to put that into a personal perspective. Sharon has been looking forward to doing this for five months and she can't be here. Think about that. So without any further ado, I would like to first ask Miss Darlene Ransom to please say a few words, Darlene. Um, we go through things, you know, uh, 
And I'm, I'm constantly talking about education and awareness of sickle cell. We, there needs to be more. He also has a different take on what it's like to be the parent caregiver of a child with sickle cell disease. And in fact, he can double his experience because he has two children with sickle cell disease. Uh, Mr. Cavalier, Anderson Cavalier. Thank you, Gary. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anderson Cavalier III. I am the father of two kids with sickle cell disease. Both have SS disease. Um, Taryn is 13 years old. Uh, she's in the seventh grade. Tanyana is 16 years old, and she is in the ninth grade. Well, actually, she's the tenth grade. I just thought I'd say that for her. <laughs> Should have seen that look on her face. Yes, I saw it. <laughs> Um, I am the parent advocate here. Um, I have never shared any type of pain like these gentlemen and young ladies up here has done. Um, all I know is that I am a parent who doesn't know what to do for their kids when they're in a lot of pain. It's kind of hard as a parent when your child comes to you and tells you, Daddy, make it stop. What do you do at that point? Um, I was going to come in and ad lib today, but I'm going to actually read some stuff that I wrote down. That way I can kind of speed it up and be precise in what I really want to say. <laughs> today I am here as a concerned and desperate parent to voice my opinion and concern about sickle cell disease being treated as an invisible ailment instead of being acknowledged as the deadly painful disease that it is. While reading the paper written by Gary Gibson, President and CEO of the Martin Center Sickle Cell initiative titled Sickle Cell Disease, The Ultimate Health Disparity, Gary noted that back in 2003, the American Academy of Pain Medicine identified and labeled the pain management protocol for sickle cell disease as disparate, chronic, and inter-episodic. I didn't understand these terms at first in relation to sickle cell, so I looked up those terms. Disparate meaning different in kind without comparison. Chronic meaning persisting for a long time or currently consistent. Inter-episodic meaning sporadic, unpredictable. If you put that together, you get a reoccurring, unpredictable, persisting pain that is different and doesn't compare to anything you've ever felt before. Basically, that's what they were trying to say. Today, as a parent, I'm here with my parents' superhero suit on to go to war for the life of my girls and all that suffer the agonizing, horrendous pain and sickness associated with sickle cell disease. I always come prepared and equipped with my basic superhero sickle cell weapons to battle those unpredictable bouts of pain and discomfort. Those med medicinal weapons include hydroxyurea, penicillin, morphine, Vicodin, Toradol, Rocephrin, Topramate, Augmentin, Albuterol, Ibuprofen, Acetaminophen, and warm packs, just to name a few. Let it be understood that these medicinal weapons only act as small maintenance and comfort protocol for a disease that has no boundaries and no cure. Every superhero should have a sidekick, but it seems like this parent superhero is alone in battle. Alone only because sickle cell disease lacks in awareness, because it has not been nationally recognized as a health disparity by Congress and those responsible for giving the parent superhero the tools needed for battle. The pain associated with sickle cell disease is only a fragment of issues that people with sickle cell deal with on a daily basis. The pain shares housing inside my child's body with ailments such as asthma and lung damage, due to pneumonia from acute chest syndromes, migraines, failed organs such as the spleen and gallbladder that eventually had to be removed, high blood pressure from the constant pain, extremely high fevers from viruses and bacterial infections associated with the common cold. The pain is also accompanied by factors outside my child's body that affects their everyday life and everyday way of living, such as social anxiety because they spend more time sick than in social settings with their peers and begin to feel left out or segregated from feeling normal. Factors such as depression with thoughts of inflicting pain on themselves and suicide because teachers and kids in school are cruel and are not aware of the chronic health disparities that sickle cell disease presents. Or just simple factors such as the physical limitations that restrict the child from participating in normal childhood activities. As I prepared myself to come in here today and verbally battle on the front line for my children's life, I had at least 50 topics of concern to touch upon. But after going through all my to topics, I kept coming back to two words, awareness and help, because those two words seemed to be the detriment and the problem. 
So today my focus is on sickle cell disease being recognized as a health disparity. What constitutes sickle cell as a health disparity? Is it the 20 bottles of medication that I bought in here today that my child takes on a daily basis? Or is it the countless doctor visits and hospitalizations and expensive, excessive medical expenses that we as parents endure? Maybe it's the 45 days per year that my daughter misses from school every year because she gets sick and is in crisis. Or maybe it's the cuts that my child inflicted on herself because she's become so accustomed to the medication and that's the only way she can deal with her pain. Or is it the cuts that my child inflicted on herself because an unaware teacher and student told her that she would die? Maybe it's when a parent gets let go from a job because they have a child in crisis that's been hospitalized for 14 or 21 days and they can't go to work. Maybe what should constitute sickle cell disease as a healthy disparity is the fact that when sickle cell patients get sick, they get to share the hematology oncology floor with cancer and leukemia patients, which are health disparities as well. So what would I like to see happen to people with sickle cell disease? I'd like to see people acknowledge that sickle cell disease is indeed a health disparity. Don't think or consider sickle cell as a health disparity topic. You've either been researching the wrong information or you've been having discussions and conversations with the wrong people. Thank you. That was Mr. Anderson Cavalier, who um, has two children with sickle cell disease, as he testified at the town hall meeting on sickle cell disease, featuring the Centers for Disease Control that we held here in Indianapolis on April 21, uh, 2016. Uh, we apologize for the audio with the first uh, speaker, uh, Ms. Darlene Ransom. Uh, for some reason, the audio didn't pick her up very well. Um, but she, too, had a very moving testimony. We're going to take a break here on the Sickle Cell Action Network, and when we return, we will continue sharing some of the testimony from the patient clients who um, gave uh, remarks at the CDC town hall meeting on April 21st. This is the Sickle Cell Action Network, and I am Gary A. Gibson, your host. Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host. The Sickle Cell Action Network is brought to you as a service of Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative. We are a 47-year-old um, agency that provides services to people that have sickle cell disease. Uh, we have a range of services, including a support group, a food pantry, a Gatorade program, we also offer emergency financial assistance, and we offer transportation assistance, and we also do general referrals. We also spend a lot of effort uh, in educating our community about sickle cell disease by participating in health fairs and giving presentations to schools and businesses. Um, and we do advocacy, and the Sickle Cell Action Network is a part of our advocacy effort. Um, in trying to do everything that we can to ensure that uh, sickle cell disease uh, receives the type of attention and notoriety that it deserves. Um, that is Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative and we are very happy to be able to provide this service to you. Among the things that we've done is the um, com recently concluded uh, town hall meeting on sickle cell disease um, that was held on April 21st, uh, 2016 here in Indianapolis and we are going to continue uh, replaying some of the client, patient testimony that took place um, during the live broadcast of this particularly special event that was held last April and we will pick up where we left off with some more patient testimony. Thank you, Mr. Cavalier. And next, uh, would like to hear from Mr. William Blunt. William, please welcome William Blunt. How's everybody doing today? Is my, is my mic on? Yes, all right. <laughs> so I'm going to be short today. So Darlene, I'll give you those two minutes back that you wanted. So just be ready. All right. So uh, since I knew that others were going to do a tremendous job today, um, articulating the challenges that people with sickle cell have, I decided to take a different approach. So today we're going to play a game. 
we're going to play a game because everybody loves playing games, right? All right. So if everybody here could please stand for me. So the game we're going to play is called Simon Says. Everybody knows Simon Says, right? All right. Everybody loves Simon Says, right? All right. So here we go. So Simon says, stay standing if you are alive today. All right. Simon says, stay standing if you feel that you are a fairly intelligent person. All right, I'm in the right place today. Nobody's, stand, <laughs> nobody's sitting down yet, so that's good. I'm a little nervous. All right. So Simon says, stay standing if you feel that sickle cell is a real disease. Okay, very good. Simon says, stay standing if you think that sickle cell, sorry, Simon says, stay standing if you think that people with sickle cell did nothing to bring that disease upon themselves. All right, very good. All right, Simon says, stay standing if you think sickle cell causes pain to those who have it. I said, Simon, sa Simon says, stay standing if you think that sickle cell causes pain to those who have it. Simon says, stay standing if, Simon says, stay standing if you think that sickle cell affects the lives of those that have it and their families. Simon says, stay standing if you think everybody's life matters no matter the illness they have. Simon says, stay standing if you think those with, those with Diseases should receive equal treatment, no matter the disease. I should have brought my glasses today because I'm having hard he reading my own. <laughs> Bear with me. <clears throat> All right, Simon says, stay standing if you think there's less done for sickle cell than others diseases like cancer. Simon says, stay standing if you think more can be done to help and support those with sickle cell. All right. So I see a lot of you are still standing. So now I ask that each of you that are standing run and make a difference for sickle cell. Thank you, William. I have to remember that one. That's pretty good. Okay, next is Julie Daniels. Julie is um, very special to us. She spent many years working at Martin Center um, and had a lot of things to do with its resurgence, but she is no longer working at Martin Center. She is now a mom and wife, and she's very special. So please welcome warmly Julie Daniels. Thank you. Um, I, I don't like following such a high bar. I asked you to set the bar low and you set the bar high. Okay. So um, as everyone knows, the journey for a person with sickle cell disease is as varied as the individuals who have it. Um, in my childhood, I didn't have a whole lot of problems. I didn't go to the hospital a lot. Um, I would have been that person with nothing on the graph. Uh, I'd been to the hospital once in my entire childhood. My cousin, alternatively, who also has sickle beta plus thalassemia, like I have, um, was in and out of the hospital all the time. In college, that all changed for me. I went to Purdue University, and within one week of being in college, I was taken by ambulance to the, to the nearest hospital. Um, it was a rough time trying to juggle college and life and being sick and constantly being in and out of the hospital. Over the six years that it took me to um, matriculate through Purdue and finally graduate, I went to the ER at least once a year. I remember distinctly the one time that I went to the ER um, in Lafayette, Indiana, 
and was asked by the nurse, what do they usually do for you, honey? Because you're our first sickle cell patient. That didn't really evoke a whole lot of confidence for me. Um, but they did manage to listen to me and treat me well, and I was able to make it out of there, and I'm here, still here today. Thank God. Um, so that was my college experience, constantly trying to find rides to the hospital, um, trying to find people who could help me. I was blessed with amazing friends um, and an amazing support system that helped me get through. And then I entered into adulthood. At the beginning of my adulthood phase, I started having more chronic pain than episodic pain. I remember distinctly going to the doctor and saying, you know, I'm in pain, I'm having pain in my hips all the time. And they're like, mm, but with your type of sickle cell, you shouldn't be having that problem. I'm like, I don't know what type I have, but I know that I have the problem. Um, it took many years to find doctors that uh, actually believed me and actually believed that I had chronic pain. And the chronic pain through my adulthood has come and has gone, um, and unfortunately has come again. And last year, it reared its ugly head again, um, having chronic pain, and chronic pain to the point where I could no longer hold the job that I was um, attached to. And along with that chronic pain and not being able to work came the depression that has also reared its ugly head several times. The isolation that comes with not working and not being able to be out amongst your peers. Um, and then the other problems that you get when you don't have a job, like not having health insurance. So then you have to go to the wonderful marketplace, which is great that we can now get the insurance off of the marketplace, but it's not the cheapest insurance out there. Um, I remember, um, or I currently many times will uh, go to my doctor's office when I um, am feeling like I'm headed into the hospital. I try to stay out of the hospital, try to work with my doctor's office. Um, but because it's not necessarily, or it, it's a great place, it's a wonderful place, I want to say that, um, but it's not a dedicated sickle cell clinic. So sometimes, even though you feel you need to go, um, there may not be any clinic chairs. In addition to no clinic chairs, if you're not feeling well, you can't necessarily drive yourself to and from the doctor's office. So then you have the additional burden of trying to find transportation, which the clinic doesn't have transportation, and so you rely on wonderful friends who can take you, or you know, your spouse has to take off work, therefore decreasing the income that's coming into the house. You see the cycle that's going on here. Um, I will say that um, my life with sickle cell has been very varied. At one time, I was, like Gary said, I did not want to tell people that I had sickle cell. I remember my sister telling her friends when I was young, and I got extremely mad at her. Um, now, I tell everyone. I tell everyone that I know that I have it. I tell everyone what happens when you have it, um, how it makes you feel, how they can help, how they can be involved, um, and I know that I appreciate you all being here today, and I think if we could get something, if there was one thing I'd say that we really wanted here in Indiana, in, India, in Indianapolis, it would be um, a dedicated sickle cell center with wraparound services, counseling, transportation, other services um, that could help the many varieties of issues that we go through. Thank you, Julie. Last but not least, as far as our patient advocate testimonies, is Lena Harvey. Lena, if you would, uh, take a few minutes and share your story. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. You don't mind if I stand up, do you? It's a little chilly up here. Um, First, I just want to say thank you to Gary Gibson and all my wonderful friends at the Martin Center. Thank you um, for having this for us today. Um, Dr. Hooper, thank you for being here. Thank you also, uh, Dr. Houlihan, for being here and taking time to, his, to hear us and to listen to what we have to say. Um, this is not only historic, but it's also a dream come true for me, as well as my fellow warriors um, and advocates. Um, it means a lot for us to be heard. 
um, which is not something that a lot of sickle cell patients, um, as well as their parents and caregivers, get to uh, experience. It's just being heard and understood. So we appreciate that. Um, my name is Lena Harvey. Um, I am level 31 uh, wife and mom. Uh, and uh, I have a, a three-year-old boy, Jackson. He's awesome. Um, I was diagnosed in Chicago in 1985. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't think they had newborn screenings in Chicago then. Um, so I was diagnosed at the age of four uh, with sickle beta thalassemia plus. Um, over the years, my sickle cell has touched every facet of my life every single facet you can think of, including, um, but not limited to, my health, obviously, my mental health, like Julie touched on, my family and friends, my finances and credit, my employment, as well as any other part you can think of. Um, my life, however, changed for the better um, once I finally started taking hydroxyurea. Um, I've been taking that for approximately four years combined. Um, and prior to that, I, I was hospitalized anywhere between three to six, seven times a year, each of those times lasting for at least five days. Um, if you can imagine having to look at your child who is in pain and has to be hospitalized um, for a debilitating disease, an unpredictable disease, such as this one, I'm sure any human person that has a heart would want to do whatever it took to help their child in that situation. Um, that child was me, and I grew up in a single parent household where my mom was everything. She was the worker, she was the cook, she was the scheduler, she, was, she did everything that she could possibly do, including be there for me when I was in the hospital. Um, over the past four years since I started taking Hydrea, I have not been in the hospital. I have not been hospitalized. And that is a huge blessing to me and my family. <laughs> it's not only a blessing because of the effect that it's had on my body and me physically, but it's a blessing because that's less money that I've had to take out of our, our, our household in order to pay for outstanding house, um, excuse me, hospital bills. Um, I was asked the question by Mr. Gary, what is missing with regards to medical treatment as well as other life issues for sickle cell patients? I was also asked, what would I like to see happen to people with sickle cell? And my answer to both of these queries was basically the same thing that Julie touched on, which is we need a comprehensive sickle cell disease only center, a place where it is specifically dedicated to sickle cell patients and our treatment. We need a place where we can come to learn proper education about our own disease. We need a place where we can come that will be, um, that will be all about proactive and reactive care. A place that will supply us with the fluids that we need, infusions, oxygen, blood transfusions, pain meds, as well as any number of other options. Our surrounding states, Ohio, Illinois and Michigan all have at least two specialized clinics dedicated to sickle cell disease. So we're indeed playing catch up um, in order to supply every warrior's needs here in Indy. In conclusion, um, I would like to urge you all to consider this. What if you and I, Dr. Hooper, what if you and I are the only people that care about sickle cell? What if it's just the two of us that care enough about the humans behind the disease? If that is so, then it's truly up to us to act on our impulses to help one another. 
because sickle cell warriors are everywhere, no matter if we are loud or quiet. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again for everyone's time and efforts and your continued works to help make sickle cell warriors' lives better. And eventually, we can make this disease a distant memory. Thank you. And that was Ms. Lena Harvey, um, one of the patient advocates who testified at the town hall meeting on sickle cell disease in Indianapolis, Indiana uh, on April 21st. We're going to take a break and when we come back we'll share a little bit more of the testimony that took place and then we will start wrapping up our show. This is the Sickle Cell Action Network and I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host. Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host, and we are um, in the middle of sharing some of the patient testimony that took place at the town hall meeting on sickle cell disease featuring the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, we have already played the patient testimony, and now we are going to continue coverage uh, by listening to the uh, testimony that followed the patient testimony. And with that, here you go. It takes a great deal of courage for people to share their lives, particularly when their lives are as troubled as some of these lives are. So please give them another round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Hooper, I was uh, contacted by Dr. Lakia Bailey, who is the executive director of the Sickle Cell Community Consortium. She was attempting to be here today, and she has a organization that has a large number of followers and members. And she actually asked if any of those people would like to share some thoughts with you because they couldn't be here. It was delivered to us by hand just a little while ago, so I'm going to give you a pile of letters <laughs> from around the country of people asking for help for sickle cell. Mm -hmm. And you can put them in this and keep them. So I really think that that's... <laughs> the fact that we have people interested from around the country in what we're doing here today in Indianapolis is one thing, but the fact that people so many people that's a pretty big stack of letters and that was actually done in about four days mm -hmm. so um, I just think that that's important and we wanted to share that with you the sickle cell space has many unmet needs most often we associate those unmet needs with patients unfortunately there are multiple unmet needs in the medical arena as well to give us a sense from the provider perspective you will now hear from Dr. Emily Meyer of the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center. Um, and then you will hear by, I believe, that's Dr. Karen Moody who is arriving <laughs> right now. Ah, okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry they didn't help with that. Um, and so um, these people will be able to give you a little bit of information about dealing with sickle cell from the provider perspective and the unmet needs in that area, which I think will then also help to highlight the fact that there are disparities involved with sickle cell. So please, first of all, join me in welcoming um, Dr. Karen Moody. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, all of you, for sharing your stories. It was really um, it's pretty amazing for you guys to do it, uh, open up that way. Um, so I'm a trained pediatric hematologist oncologist and now the director for pediatric palliative care. I work at Riley Hospital for Children in Indianapolis and I've been there for about two years. I came actually from New York City. I worked in the Bronx for um, about 10 years and between that job and my training previously and my previous jobs and my current job, I have taken care of hundreds of babies, children, adolescents, and young adults with sickle cell disease. I've moved primarily into helping with pain management for children with sickle cell. I'm, I've moved out of the sort of hematology arena with my most current position. And um, when I was first thinking about what to share with you today, 
Um, I, I think it's only honest to just tell you that pediatric pain management is a problem kind of globally. Um, there is not enough data, there is not enough training opportunities, there's not enough education, and that goes from the beginning of medical school through pediatric residency, um, through really training to be a hematologist. Um, in my fellowship training, even, I had, you know, I was given some direction for pain management, but it was pretty limited. Um, and so the problem of a lack of good um, skill sets, expertise, accessibility, availability of pain management for children is affecting everybody that's in pain that's a child and their family, but clearly the sickle cell population is greatly impacted for obvious reasons. And in truth, this population may be one of the most impacted populations of this problem. Um, because the reality is in the terminal population, it's a short-lived issue and people escalate drugs extremely high, but in a chronic illness, it's not really feasible to do that. So we need other better ways to take care of pain in sickle cell patients and we need whatever information is out there to be spread so that people have the information and can um, provide the information to families and also families. And also we need more providers that provide not only just information but the resources which I'll kind of get into. So Vasoocclusive crisis pain and chronic pain are both very common problems with sickle cell disease. And I think the chronic pain problem, although much smaller in prevalence than the crisis pain, is very real. And I think not enough people know about it. And so sometimes sickle cell patients are not believed, truthfully, that they have chronic pain, but it is for sure occurs. Um, and I think we need to think about managing sickle cell patients with opioids, but very careful. So like just enough, but not too much. You know, enough to adequately treat pain, but not so much that there's toxicity and complications. As you mentioned before, the sort of cycle of withdrawal and recurrent admissions. I think people under-recognize that uh, very commonly. Um, and certainly the hydroxyurea has been huge for this population of patients, but it hasn't worked for everyone, or there's been limiting side effects. And so, you know, there's not one fix for everybody. And so we still need to be creative about um, how to manage uh, patients with pain. I think in addition, um, there are um, limited data for even what types of drugs to use in pain management in sickle cell disease. So even though there's literature in adult chronic pain, um, it's not clear whether all of that can be extrapolated to patients with sickle cell disease. And we certainly consider using some of those medications, but we don't know really truthfully what the safety profile is in a disease that is as multi-system as sickle cell disease. Um, but there are options, right? There are topical options and there are non-opioid options. And I think that um, there are either, even sort of non-pharmacologic, so non-drug options to consider for patients with sickle cell disease. But it is not clear that those options are presented or are readily available or that people have the resources to get them um, with, if they have sickle cell disease. But I definitely think that until there is more data available, we have to try and promote some of these other interventions. Um, and try to promote getting resources. One thing I'll, I'll mention is that there, you, I don't think you can underestimate the kind of basics, right, of just healthy lifestyle, of eating well, and of fostering a positive mental health and emotional support. Um, I think given what you can be up against with sickle cell, so there's the disease itself, which is very tough, has a lot of problems, and as you mentioned before, they can increase with age. But also there are, I think, issues, real issues within the medical establishment with being able to know what's going on with the sickle cell patient, to be able to see the picture completely, to, be, to know about chronic pain syndromes, to know about withdrawal once you come off the PCA and that it can trigger another crisis. And so there's a lot, um, I think, that sickle cell patients are up against. And the social pieces as well of being sick and missing school and being different. And so because of that, a lot of support is needed. You know, I work in palliative care, so I work with families who are often facing losing their child, um, t t dying in their child. And I tell them you need a ton of support to get through this. And I think the same is true for kids with chronic illness. You need a lot of support. And the question is, where do we get it? I mean, is it peer support? Is it um, psychological support? Is it pastoral support? Is it spiritual support? Where do we get it? How do we make sure it's accessible? How do we make sure that everybody has access to the type of support that will work for them? Because it's going to be different for everybody. Um, and who's going to pay for it? You know, who's going to pay for these types of services? Are they covered? You know, so sometimes they're available, but then the insurance won't pay for them. So, 
it's just challenging. Um, some of the things I think about in helping my sickle cell patients are, you know, what kind of exercise are they doing? And, you know, a lot of times it's difficult to engage in an exercise program if you have pain, right? If your legs hurt, you can't run, you know. But things like a whirlpool or swimming might be helpful, but do we have access to those things? Is there a way to get access to those things? What do they cost? How do you get there? What's the transportation issues? And I love the wraparound service idea with a comprehensive program because that is truly what, what we need if people are going to get the help that they need. Um, and even if you think kind of outside the box to ideas like guided imagery or meditation or acupuncture, things that might help, we don't know, but maybe might be safe, um, again, who's going to teach that? Who's going to support it? Who's going to pay for it? How are you going to access it? Um, I want to mention that I was recently involved in a few studies in sickle cell disease. I've been interested in trying to study interventions uh, for pain in this population. A very, we did a very small pilot just looking at yoga in kids with sickle cell. And I just want to mention that um, we did see some improvement in pain, but the, some of the quotes from the kids were about how their perspective shifted. So they would say things like, I still have the pain, but I'm okay with it now, or I'm not bothered as much, or um, I can face my day a little better, or but I feel much more relaxed. And so when I think about pain, there's always sort of pain and suffering, right? There's pain and suffering. And I think you have to intervene on both levels. So we need interventions that will sort of physiologically target pain, and we need interventions that will target the sort of global suffering, the suffering of the body, but the suffering of the mind, the suffering of social life, the suffering of the emotions, the suffering of the spirit, all those things that happen when, when you have pain. I mean, chronic pain affects kind of everything in a person or can. Um, so then we moved on from that to do a prospective study of yoga, and we did it as a randomized trial, looking at using yoga as an intervention in, in the acute crisis setting. We did this study in New York City and with 75 patients. We randomized them to get either the yoga or for them to listen to a Nature Sounds uh, compact disc. And we had a hospital-wide pain management protocol. So everybody sort of had the same pain management protocol. But the only difference for our group of patients was whether or not they also received yoga or the Nature Sounds. And we did find that the yoga seemed to help with even pain scores statistically. Um, and like I said, the sort of um, subjective perspectives of patients reporting that they were able to maybe make a little bit of a separation suddenly between the pain and the suffering. Um, so, I mean, it was promising that maybe there are things that we can do that can be learned, that can be done at home, that then families can teach each other, that can be practiced, um, that won't necessarily be another medication, and things that can be done so that people can feel that they have more skills to manage their own illness. Um, one of the interventions in the chronic pain world is cognitive and behavioral therapies, so ways to reframe thinking about the disease, ways to modify your activity, because as you know, you have to really kind of respect the signals your body sends you, or are you doing too much? Um, and you were listening to uh, uh, Dr. Karen Moody, who also spoke at the town much. hall on sickle cell disease, featuring the Centers for Disease Control here in Indianapolis on April 21st. Um, and we would like to thank everyone that participated in that event, and we certainly hope that you have enjo enjoyed listening um, to the replay of the live broadcast that took place on April 21st. Um, this is the Sickle Cell Action Network, and it is time to close out our show for the day. And as always, I'll provide you with something to think about. And I will start with a quote that says, Self-worth comes from one thing thinking that you are worthy. And this is the quote from uh, Mr. Wayne Dyer. Wayne Dyer was an American philosopher, a self-help author, and a motivational speaker. His first book, Your Erroneous Zones, uh, published in 1976, is one of the best-selling books of all time with an estimated 35 million copies sold to date. He spent much of his childhood in an orphanage on the east side of Detroit as after his father walked out on the family, leaving his mother to raise three small boys, so he knows the importance of self-worth. In January of 2013, someone paid $10,016,875 for a $1 coin. It wasn't just any coin. It was an extremely rare 1794 flowing hair dollar. The flowing hair dollar was the first dollar coin issued by the United States government. It was minted in 1794 and 1795. 
Its size and weight were based on the Spanish dollar, which was popular in trade throughout the Americas. There are many other coins that have fetched millions of dollars at auctions, including an 1894 dime that sold for $1,997,500 in January of this year. Paying almost $2 million for a dime only makes sense to those collectors who believe that it is worth that much. You and I, however, might think that paying that much for a tiny piece of stamped metal is just plain stupid. But here's the point I'm driving at. What you and I think isn't worth very much is worth a tremendous amount more to others. In other words, value is pretty much like beauty. It is in the eye of the beholder. That leads me to ask this question. Do you let others give you your value, or do you establish that value yourself? Yes, it would be nice if everyone else thought that you were worth millions, but as you know, people generally tend to devalue things, especially when it is something that they are trying to acquire. After all, they think, why pay more for something than you have to? That is one of the elements of capitalism. In fact, how much someone can profit from something seems to be one of capitalism's driving forces. In the end, an item's true value doesn't matter as much as what someone is willing to pay for it. When you go to the store to buy something, the first thing you do is look at the price sticker. It doesn't matter if it's a car or a candy bar. The price on the sticker is just the amount that the seller wants for that item. You didn't choose the original asking price, someone else did. So why shouldn't you set your own value, your own self-worth? The answer is, you should. If you leave it up to others, you will almost always be undervalued. Sometimes that happens because the other person feels that they have to devalue you in order to increase their own self-worth. But no matter what value they place on you, you need to realize that that value is only in their head. It has nothing to do with what you are actually worth. Only you can set that value, and only you can change it. If you have a chronic illness like sickle cell disease, you may tend to fall into the trap of devaluing yourself. You may have a tendency to compare yourself to others who don't have to live with the obstacles that are in your life. You might even think that they are better, thus more valuable than you. Don't fall into that emotional ambush. Because of who you are and the many triumphs you've made over your condition, you should start considering the fact that your value as a human being is actually a whole lot higher than you've been giving yourself credit for. After all, how many people do you know who can withstand what you go through? There is much, much value in that, my friends. So I encourage you to remember what Wayne Dyer said. Self-worth comes from one thing, thinking that you are worthy. That's, that's our show for today. Please join us again next week. Mass Therapeutics is leading the way in developing treatments for sickle cell disease. We're proud to 